Very good. So today we take our third installment in the well stories, Water from the Well, as we move through the various stories about wells that we find in our Holy Scriptures. Beginning that first Sunday with the story of the woman at the well and Jesus' initiative to step beyond all of the various boundaries and borders and restrictions that would have kept him from conversation with her, much less an exchange of deep wisdom and love between them. And last week we looked at the story of the miraculous well that emerges to nourish and to save Hagar and Ishmael so that they would survive and be able to continue in the blessedness that they received as children and wife of Abraham, now exiled. And we remembered how God reaches out to give water to those who are often rejected or exiled. Today, I want to look at a third well story, and this story is really kind of the second verse of a story that began with Abraham. Because Abraham, some of you may remember, when he moved into this territory with his wife Sarah, as they were coming into the land before they met Abimelech, who was the kind of chieftain of that region, he said, now don't tell them you're my wife, tell them you're my sister, because if they think you're my wife, they might kill me and take you. But if you're my sister, then I can just let them have you. <laughs> and I won't die, right? That's kind of how he was thinking about that. And, uh, and so that's what they do, but Abimelech has a dream and realizes that this woman is actually his wife, and he confronts Abraham about it. He goes, what are you doing to me? If, if I had laid with your wife, then, then, then a curse would have fallen upon me and my people, and we would have had a bad time of it. And so uh, here's your wife back, and don't you ever do that again, you know? Well, like father, like son. <laughs> because in the verses preceding what we read today, Isaac moves into the same land where Abimelech is still king. And, uh, and he says to Rebekah, his wife, now listen. When we come into this land, pretend you're my sister and not my wife. You know, you'd think some people would learn from the generations before them. But... Uh, I don't know about your family, but in my family, we don't always learn those lessons either, right? We repeat them. We do the same thing that the generation before did sometimes, <coughs> repeating the same erroneous behavior. Well, that's what Isaac does. And he passes off Rebecca as his sister. This time, though, Abimelech doesn't have a dream. He's hanging out and observing Isaac and Rebecca and notices them being it notices Isaac caressing Rebecca in a way that would not be appropriate for uh, a sister. And so, uh, so he says, hey, wait a minute. And he gets in there and he's like, what are you doing? You know, you told me this was his si your sister. What if one of my people had married her or taken her as a wife and laid with her then? We'd have been cursed. How could you do this to us? And Isaac says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Abimelech says, here. I'm going to exonerate your wife of any misdeed. And so uh, he says, take, take some servants, take some, some money, and take some cattle, and get out of here, would you? I don't need people like you, lion, <laughs> getting me and my people in trouble. And so Isaac takes off. And he goes to the area where his dad had lived before, and I don't remember well enough whether that was where he also lived with his father. But I think it probably was because when they get there, they begin to excavate again the wells where his father had drawn water before. And they excavate the first well and it fills up with water and it's a, it's a, it's a good well, it's a productive well. But as soon as it shows itself to be productive, what happens? But the other uh, sheep herders in the area come over and they go, hey, dude, this is our water, not yours. Get out of here. And so he names the well Dispute because they disputed over the water. 
So he goes and finds one of the other wells, and he digs that one up, and, and that well uh, becomes, uh, becomes also very uh, abundant. And so they are gathered around the well, he's camping around the well, and then the sheep herders from that area come in and they go, hey, 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 this is our place, this is our land, our water, get out of here. And so he calls this well by a name that means something like enemistad, uh, enmity. So he goes and finds one more well, and he digs this last well, and in this last place, finally the water comes up, and the people around don't contend with him or dispute with him over whose water it is, but simply allow him the space to live. And he says, I will call this well room to be, because God has finally given us a place to be. I read those words in the context of all of the news reports about 4,500 people from Central America who are just looking for room to be. They don't feel safe in their homeland. They can't provide for their families in their homeland because of the econ economics of the reality. They are deeply desiring space simply to be themselves, just like Isaac did. And as they make their progress up through Central America to the borders of Mexico, all they experience is what Isaac experienced. People saying, hey, 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 this is our land. You don't, we don't want you here. And even before they reach our borders, our nation is already saying, no, 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 no. We don't want you here either. And it's not just Central Americans. This is happening in Europe as the African continent, which also is unable in many places to sustain the livelihood and the well-being of its people. They are migrating. They are looking for a room to be themselves, a place to be able to be themselves. And many of the nations are going, huh? -uh. And a couple are going, okay. But once those migrants arrive, often the social discord elevates and the tensions arise within those nations like Germany and Italy. And again, the message is, we don't want you. This is our land. Isaac just wanted a place to be, a place to raise his family, a place to plant his crops, a place to be able to live in peace. He moves along from that place to another place known as Beersheba, where they begin to dig for water one more time. And in the process of that well digging, Abimelech shows up with his commanders and right hand and left hand guys, right? And Isaac is like, what are you doing here? You know, you threw me out. He says, well, it's clear that God has blessed you because you have grown very, very wealthy. <clears throat> In the previous place where they had dug the successful well that was not contentious, they had planted crops and grown a hundredfold in one season. And so Isaac was prospering. His people were prospering. His family, his clan, his cattle, his herds were prospering. Probably goats and sheep, not cattle. And Abimelech comes and he says, hey, we recognize you're blessed. And we'd like to seek peace with you, formally, in an agreement. We didn't treat you badly. We didn't hurt you. We didn't attack you. We didn't molest your wife, even though you did try to pass her off as a sister. And we'd like for you to agree not to attack us. For they saw that Isaac was now perhaps the stronger of the two. And Isaac welcomes them, offers the hospitality of his tent, and in the morning they, they swear oaths to one another. And so the well, as the well uh, is being dug, and as they are swearing the oath, the servants come and they say, we've struck water. And Isaac says, then we will call this well the well of the oath. 
For here we have sworn peace to one another. And this story about all of these wells brings up for me the issue of what we, the things we do to inhibit the contentment and the blessing that God seeks to give to us. Because I see in this story two fundamental things that we human beings struggle with on a regular basis. Envy and fear. Envy and fear. Both of which become inhibitors to our ability to live in the abundant life and in the abundant blessing that God desires to offer us. Envy works both from within and without as an obstacle. The sheep herders who were envious of the nice well that Isaac had redug, that his father had dug before him, from the, their envy toward him results in their wanting to take over or take in their own possession something that belonged to Isaac at that moment because he had dug it. And so the blessing of that water is lost to Isaac because of the enviousness of those other people in the land. But envy can also work from within, can it not? When we are constantly looking at the things that other people have that we don't have, which then motivate us to want to acquire more and more and more and more. It was through my time in Central America doing mission trips and other observations with study groups from seminary and after seminary that I learned a lesson that has been very important for me. You know, often when we're climbing the ladder of success, we are always looking up at the folks who are further ahead. And if that's the only place we look, if we are always looking at those who have more than we do, then we are always going to feel poor. And we are always going to feel like we don't have enough because somebody else has more. But if we can take the time to look at the other folks who may not have as much as we do, it can birth in us a sense of contentment that we have enough. And we don't need to be grabbing and grasping for more and more constantly. Envious of those who have something that we wish we had but do not have. Contentment is robbed by our envy. There's a story that I think I've told here before about a a fisherman on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico who lived in a very humble shack and had uh, his kids and his wife and one fishing boat and a couple of fishing rods and, and he would go out every day and catch enough fish for his family and bring them home and they'd cook them and eat them and, and they lived contentedly and peacefully. His kids played in the ocean. They lived in a, a house that kept them uh, warm and that kept them out of the rain. And one day, down to this little fishing village came a gringo from uh, Texas who, who came down for his fishing vacation. He had new, freshly retired and he was down for a fishing vacation. He was all excited and went out and had a lovely time fishing that day and met this, uh, met this fisherman and they had a conversation with one another. And he said, you know, this is such a great place. The fish are so abundant. You know, you really could do very well here if you would just kind of up your game a little bit. One, maybe build another boat, send your kids out to fish too, and then you'd have extra fish and you could sell some of that fish. And Juan was like, well, what would I do with that? Well, you could buy another boat. You could even hire some other people to fish for you. And you could have a whole fleet of boats and you could be catching so many fish that, that you could sell them in the market and then you would earn even more money and then you, could, then you could build a fishing factory and, I mean, a canning factory and you could can that fish or dry that fish and sell it all over the world and you could become rich and famous. And then what would I do? Well, when you got rich enough, you could retire and you could come down like I do and you could fish on the shore and just relax and enjoy your life. Juan looked at this idiot 
And he said, why would I go to all that trouble? Because I'm already doing exactly what I want to do. Fishing every day, enjoying my kids, and delighting in this environment where I live. More, 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 right? We can't even enjoy what we have in our hands. Fear is the other thing that becomes an obstacle to our contentment. And it's often fear of losing what we have, right? It's another form of grasping. It's grasping to hold what we have so that we don't lose it, so that somebody else doesn't take it from us. It is that fear of losing something we currently possess that also can get in the way of our capacity to live contentedly. I don't know how many people I've met who, who are afraid of their investments losing value, who are constantly peering at the stock market to see what's happening to make sure that they make the right choice, to make sure nothing gets lost, and the anxiety and the uncertainty in their lives over just that one piece of their possessions is huge. How about the fear that we have in our homes of losing what we possess? The alarm systems we create, the, the companies that put those alarm systems in who are known for calling every home in a neighborhood if they can get a hold of the phone numbers when there has been a robbery in a community. I got those phone calls many times. You know, uh, there was a robbery in your street just this last week and uh, we happened to be in the neighborhood and would like to sell you an alarm. It's going to cost you $200 and then you're going to be paying $25 every month of the year for the rest of your life in order to secure your things. And I would say, you know what? The best security for my things is my neighbors. My neighbors watch me and I watch my neighbors. And that's the best security I could ask for. Click. Fear. Fear is what's used to motivate this hanging on. They say that in some jungle communities, they catch monkeys because monkeys are afraid to let go of what they have in their hands. The monkey trap is very simple. It's a box with a hole in it that's about that big, big enough for the monkey to get his hand in, but once he grabs what's in there, he can't pull it out because the hole is too small for his fist, but just big enough for his hand. And so the hunters will put a piece of food, a banana or some kind of food in there, and the monkey will grab it, and when the hunters are coming, they won't let go of the banana because they don't want to release what they have, and as a result of it, they get caught and killed. Perhaps a parable for us. It's never in grasping that we will find contentment. Whether it is grasping for something we don't have and we wish we did, or grasping to hold on to the things that we have, contentment will never come that way. Blessing will never be experienced that way. Blessing comes when we can live open-handedly to offer and to share and to welcome and receive the gifts that are already here. So my hope is that we can understand that if we want to live contented and happy lives, we need not be grasping. We need simply to open our hands, to share and to welcome the gifts that God already is giving. Let us pray. God, help us to see our craziness with clarity. Help us to discern our grasping and holding and the ways in which it creates fear and discontent and anxiety in our lives. And set us free that we may simply have room to be 
who you made us to be. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.